And uh, so basically this session will be, we are going to recap uh, what happened this year, because as you know, this year, the FRS S3 exam has turned to be live face-to-face -face exam after a long time of COVID um, restrictions with an online exam. So this resulted in that the centers that all over the world have been recovering from this COVID problem and they, they are not performing the perfect way. They are still being struggling to give you the ultimate experience that you are expecting as a candidate in FRS S3 exam. So I'm here trying to ease the onboarding process for them and for you. I will try to summarize what happened this year according to the last updates and also uh, give you a fair orientation about what are you going to do and what are you going to expect when you have to do this exam again. So be, uh, luckily we have some candidates who have this exam in this year and they will be happy to share you, their experience with you at the end of the session. So to make this session more organized, I just um, make it into different uh, sections. So the agenda for this meeting will be, I'm going to first give you like a brief orientation about what happened this year about the exam model after the last updates and then the past candidates experience that I received from those who had their exam in India and in Cairo this year. Also, I will just share with you some study tips, not from me because my study tips are already available on YouTube and in different orientation sessions, but I will just copy the words of my previous candidates say to me this year so that they can be helpful to know how is the status of the exam this year and what are the mindset of the exam and the mindset of the examiners. And finally, I'm going to tell you surprise and the questions and answer sessions where our candidates will be happy to share your experience. So they will be, if, the, if anyone who had this exam this year and want to show you what are the cases, what are the tips that he found useful, he is free to do so. Okay, so for those who are, I know that many of you had uh, joined us after the live sessions, uh, which is, I'm regretting for that. I'm sorry that my personal circumstances are not the ideal nowadays to uh, conduct such lengthy course, but I hope that this session will help them to be to go with the flow, if we can say that, to be on the same, to speak the same language as we used to speak when we had the previous live sessions. And also it's a great privilege to see all our old candidates from the last year. So let's me start with the FRCS exam updates. So previously the exam was used to be conducted in India, in Egypt, Jordan, Oman, Malta, and UK in Glasgow. But nowadays, until till the last updates, the exam has opened only in India and Egypt. So in India, it, is, it, is, it is, has been performed in three centers in this year. And in Egypt, it was the first to be conducted this year in, in 2022. So it will be the first time to be conducted in Egypt. We are still waiting for other centers to be open. So I'm just telling you what is the case right now. And to my mind, this happens because of whenever the, um, the, the local regulations just ease the restrictions over, um, over socialization and, this and, and, and distancing. So whenever these regulations being eased, then the, it will be more easy to conduct the exam as face-to-face -face exam. So this is what is expected that what happened in Egypt and India, that the, the local authorities allowed that people can gather and people can interact in face-to-face -face manner. That's how they approved it to be conducted in India and Egypt. So I don't think that the problem in the Royal College itself, more than the problem is within the countries th themselves. So if you ask me which one will be next, I would expect that it will be the UK. And why is that? because the Royal College of Ophthalmologist exams has been conducted in, like in a face-to-face -face manner since or starting from the next November, the FRC of part two will be like live exam, like face-to-face. -face. So I'm expecting that since the Royal College has done this, 
then the Royal College of Surgeons of Glasgow will do that next year, and also Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. So we are waiting for this to happen. We only had the uh, dates for 2022. So, and I also expected that Jordan, Oman, and Malta will open next year. So what are the exam timing if you are expecting or what, what do you, what do we, like when you think, okay, so I'm now want to have my exam, what are the available timing or available dates? The 2022 dates have been announced earlier like a package. So there was in Bangalore, in India, in May, in Cairo, in June, and New Delhi in September and in Mumbai in November. So those are the dates for 2022. So if you think, okay, so I want to book my exam, when, do, when shall I expect? You should expect it. I believe that it will be by the end of this year. So they will open for 2023 uh, dives. And you would know, don't worry about that because they will open like many dives and like, like every, the news spread, the word spread everywhere and you would be aware of that. But if you want to keep an eye on that, you always need to check their website because this is the only way you can find information about the exam timings. So the availability of the exam, this is also another question that you might think about. The availability of this exam is like 40 candles per diet. And this doesn't or hasn't it changed since it was live before the COVID. It, was, it has been always 40 candidates and there was always a, 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 a waiting list. However, nowadays the waiting list become more and more because of the uh, backlog of the previous candidates who had their example postponed from the COVID-19. So they, according to the regulations, they will have 40 candidates uh, per diet and there will be another 10 candidates who are on their waiting list so that when one of these 40 will cancel or postpone their exam for any unforeseen circumstances, in this case, that will, there will be a compensation from these 10 uh, candidates of waiting list. However, to just it, it's worth mentioning that the priority will be always given to the backlog candidates. But this doesn't mean that in 2022, there were no fresh candidates. I, I can confirm to you that there were fresh candidates who have been applying for the first time in 2022 and they had their seats secured in 2022. So don't get frustrated by the backlog. You will always be accommodated. Also, Also regarding the fees of this exam, so as per the last fees, the exam is costing 1,800 pounds. So you need also to consider this. Okay, so these are the FRSS3 exams updates in 2022. Let's now talk about the structure of the exam itself. So this, the exam structure tended to vary not from year to year, but every now and then. So since the exam is returned to be face-to-face -face again, let me also tell you how the exam looked like. So there was two days. One day is for Viva exam, which is the oral exam. These will be three stations. Each station will last for 20 minutes. There is a station for neuro-ophthalmology and general medicine, another station for posterior segment and the glaucoma, and another station for anterior segment and oculoplastics. So this will be one day. Another day will be for the OSCE or the practical exam. For the OSCE, it will be a session for neuro-ophthalmology and strabismus for 12 minutes. So each session will be for 12 minutes, posterior segment for 12 minutes, and two segment for 12 minutes and oculoplastics for 12 minutes. So this exam uh, or this day is a bit challenging in, in terms of time. And you need to uh, think carefully about that. And we will discuss this by the end of the session about the tips that you may consider before uh, going this, to this exam. So let me now share you my feedback from my candidates for the 2022 exams. So this would be like the first collection of 22 exams of past candidates experience. It is not that everyone had all these questions, but I just 
uh, summarized them in stations. So you would know what are the high yield topics that come in the exams. So you will tailor your study accordingly. So for the VIVA, we had the neuro-ophthalmology and general medicine related to ophthalmology. And in this session, my candidates were asked about anterior ischemic optic neuropathy due to giant cell arthritis, optic neuritis, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, unilateral headache, which was they are asking mainly about post-herpetic neuralgia, sarcoidosis and tuberculosis and their relation to eye, virtual retinopathy, and investigation of scleritis to talk about the rheumatoid arthritis and different investigations related to connective tissue diseases, sixth nerve palsy, and also accommodative isotropia. The second session is the posterior segment and the glaucoma. So in this session, the candidates were asked about the management of normal tension glaucoma, pseudo exfoliation glaucoma, and myopia, a patient with myopia and vitreous hemorrhage and how to manage, a picture of Stargard disease and how to diagnose, retinopathy of prematurity with risk factors, stages, when and how to treat, age-related macular degeneration, either the wet type or dry type, branch retinal vein occlusion, retinal detachment, choroidal mass and leukocoria differential diagnosis and differences between the nevus and chirpy the congenital hypertrophy of retinal pigment epithelium. So these were the VIVA questions for posterior segment and the glaucoma stations. For the anterior segment and oculoplasty, they were asked about giant papillary conjunctivitis, tresium, a newborn with watery eye and how to manage, a chemical injury, fungal keratitis, avellino and lattice dystrophy, upper lip globoma, entropion in an old man, and basal cell carcinoma. Now let's move to the next day, which is the OSCE day. So the OSCE day, these scenarios are quite common, like the same that we discussed in the course, like the same examination techniques. So relative afferent pupillary defect. So pupil examination is a must in the exam, as you know, relative afferent pupillary defect, what are the causes? What is the next step? What are you going to do? Motility, the slit lamp examination, fundus examination, Anisocoria, so there, there was a case with a third nerve palsy and how to manage whether it is medical or surgical, what, what is the role of neuroimaging. A case of motility for with, presented with bilateral ptosis so that you would know at the end that it is a chronic progressive external of thermoplegia, a skernet sire syndrome, and the role of the ECG for, to, for detection of heart block. This is one of the crucial things that we need to know. And motility for a patient with, uh, there was a patient with medial rectus palsy, mostly also it has a third nerve palsy, and he had repair, and this is a repair followed by a post-operative granuloma. So this was the case uh, in the motility station. In the posterior segment station, there was a case about Stargard disease also, and another case about macular edema with exudates so that you would uh, have been asked about differential diagnosis and management of diabetic retinopathy and different classes of the anti -BGF. Also a case with peripheral neovascularization to check with the indirect ophthalmoscopy, branch retinal vein occlusion management, and there was a case to detect it by the indirect ophthalmoscopy, just the PRP scars, and there were no questions in this station apart from that. So just the PRP scars. For the anterior segment station, the cases are almost identical in every exam. There were this, I think this is, will be the considered the easiest one. So you will always have a graft in the in the exam. So the graft either can be you find a corneal dystrophy in one eye and then a keratoplasty in the other eye. So you would always whatever whenever you have a graft, always ask to check for the other eye because the other eye will tell you the pathology in this eye. So it could be a dystrophy in one eye and keratoplasty in the other eye, or it can be keratoconus in one eye and graft in the other eye. So the candidate was asked about a young adult female with a keratoplasty, what is the type of this graft and why this patient had graft and then, then look to the other eye, there was keratoconus with epical scarring and how to treat keratoconus in general. Or the condition in the cornea could be sometimes a pre-graft, 
like pseudophotic velocity. So you will you wouldn't be able to check for the corneal gutata in with this eye. So you would ask for the other eye to check for the corneal gutata and you know the diagnosis. And it is unlikely that this will the exam will show you hot cases. However, it can happen. Like for my for example, in my exam, I had a patient with active herpetic keratitis in anterior segmentation. I had another patient with active or recurrent retinal detachment, fresh retinal detachment with vitreous hemorrhage in the posterior segment. So it is most likely that there is, will be no active cases or no active diseases, but you need also, or to say painful diseases, but this can happen sometimes. Okay, so this is for the cornea, mostly the same, the same stuff. Now for glaucoma, you might you will find trabeculectomy to comment on the blib to check for the causes. So you might find signs of pseudoexfoliations, of phacodinesis, and the questions will be about concerns for cataract surgery, as we discussed in much details in the course. And for tube, uh, glaucoma drainage device with a patient with a circumferential iris atrophy and why it is not pigment dispersion syndrome, because you know the difference or the different in pattern of iris atrophy. Another patient with uvgitis who was like a young female with keratic precipitates and what is the differential diagnosis of anterior uvgitis. So this was the, finally, the oculoplastics, which will be almost always a case of proptosis or a case of ptosis. And this is a, the, here is a very important thing I will tell you right now. So, so there was a case of proptosis asking about the examination steps and uh, measure with the Hertz exothermometry because this patient had thyroid eye disease. Another patient, I was told by another candidate that there was a thyroid eye disease with lateral traction. And then the, the candidate was asked to do measurements and to, to do the exothermometry. However, the candidates reported that there is no proptosis. And she told me that the, the examiners were satisfied from her answer. They didn't disagree. They didn't see that this is something wrong. And you see, and I can tell you that this candidate passed the exam. So this is a very important thing to consider here, that it is not always that you will find findings in the exam. Sometimes the patient or we can give you, um, tell you to do an assessment and the patient will be normal. This is normal. Please trust your skills, trust yourself. It is not always that you will find the pathology, okay? So sometimes the exams can get tricky. And if you are not very confident of, of yourself, then you might fail in mistakes. So if, if, the, if this candidate passed this station and all other candidates who told me that they had to do examination and it is the same case because I see that this might be the same case and they diagnose it as a proptosis, in this case, they would fail the exam because there is no actual proptosis. It is just a pseudo proptosis or they, they might didn't, or they may not did the uh, hertel exothermometer well, or doesn't know the normal values. So many possibilities, but sometimes you need to consider this, it can be normal. For ptosis, the patient with, uh, had a, there was a patient with ptosis and to assess the levator function and this and the motility. And finally, this patient turned out to be my senior gravis. Another patient with ptosis who was young with unilateral ptosis and the full examination uh, and measurements revealed scar on the upper eyelid. Remember when I told you in the course that scars in this exam is very important. Scars in the temple for joint cell arthritis, scars for craniotomy, scars for levator resection. This is very important. So this patient has a congenital ptosis with previous repair and this is scar together with the other signs of levator malfunction in congenital ptosis was the key for diagnosis of this case. Okay, so I hope that this is clear now for you to know how to get like a taste of the exam. How does the exam look like? And what kind of cases that will you, 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 might, you may prob probably see in the exam? You can see that they are all normal cases. They are, there are no extremes here or no bizarre cases. So 
the question is, okay, so if the cases are easy and we are encountering them in our day-to-day -day practice, what was the result of these exams? Are they good results? To be honest with you, the, the, the results were not as expected compared to the level of difficulty of the exam. So as far as I heard, like the, the pass rate in this exam was like a 10% or 20%. So I, I previously discussed this in group, why I believe that this was the result. I don't believe that this will be the case in the next exams. I believe that if you will return to the normal pass ratio, which is around 50%, so you don't need to worry that much about this, but I can tell you some of my uh, analysis to why this was the case. And also I will give you my feedback that I received about the different centers. So for the UK, uh, this was the most professional examiners. If you want the examiners who will score you professionally, it will be the most in the UK. However, you need to be prepared that you will find mostly there are the complex case in the UK. Like for example, if you are raised in a country where you don't see HIV cases that much, you don't expect that in the UK. So you will have many cases of UK, of, of acute retinal necrosis, progressive outer retinal necrosis, cytomegalovirus retinitis, which you, you might have never seen in your practice because you don't have HIV cases that are quite common. Okay, so you need you need to be you need to be minded that the cases will depend mainly on the common practice in this country. Okay. In India, the, the cases was easy. So most of the majority of cases I show you today were from the Indian centers. However, the based on the poor score that happened this year in India. They can, I would assume that the examiners underestimate the candidate's performance. So because we, as I told you before in the group, there is no reason why the uh, candidates will have poor performance. They go to their clinics, they have been practicing for more than two or three years, and they are waiting eagerly for this exam. So it will be more likely that the candidates are experienced. However, the examiners are not well experienced because that they abandoned the, um, the life exam for like two years now. For Cairo, there was good organization. The exam was good organized. Speaking about that, it was like done for the first time. So you, we, we, there were no issues about organization. However, it was that some examiners are unexperienced. They were not, they were unable to lead the candidates. Of course, it is not the general rule. I'm saying that there are some examiners who are unexperienced and unable to lead. And also the pediatric exam was tough. So I would, because I was like trained in Egypt, I would know how it is difficult sometimes to deal with pediatric population. I think this is the case with every country. So children are unpredictable. So like when there was like a candidate who had been examined on three kids um, with the language barrier with the, and with different the culture, you may not be able to handle the kids. So you need also to think about that. The Jordan exams are tend to be some, sometimes complicated conditions or conditions with double pathology. So I don't know why that, but for, 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 for Jordan, they love to bring some cases which are a little bit rare or a little bit uh, strange. And uh, also the examination devices like sit lamps were not of the best quality. So also you need to be aware of that. So these are the commonest exam centers that I received the feedback about them. So now let's, uh, let me tell you more about the grading system. So you, you would know if you fail in a, a case or a fail a station, because I received this question almost every day and from all candidates. So they would tell me, okay, I feel I didn't do well in this case. Would I fail the exam? So you need to have clear mind about the grading system. So there are five grades of each case. Every case or every station is graded by two examiners. Each one of the two examiners will give you a score. It could be either like clear pass, 
when you answer everything without prompt and with when you don't uh, you 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 have your answers clear and correct or fair pass when the examiner leads you to the correct answer and you would eventually reach the correct answer with guidance or pass when you do like some mistakes but overall your answer is acceptable you you didn't do like serious mistakes or fail when you like fail to recognize a common thing or a serious thing and it is not acceptable for the examiner to pass you so he would score you as fail or clear fail like when you didn't say anything or you fail to recognize a very easy or a very common case or you did like a serious mistake that will jeopardize the patient's um, uh, life or the patient's vision. In this case, you would take like a clear fail. So what are the passing criteria after knowing the grades? You need, of course, to pass the whole exam, like to pass the OSCE exam and to pass the VIVA. In this case, you will pass the exam. However, if you pass the OSCE and failed the VIVA with sufficient extra marks from the OSCE exam, this will compensate a poor performance in the VIVA stations. So this will be that the OSCE will compensate for the VIVA, but it is not the reverse. It is not the other way around. So the VIVA wouldn't uh, compensate for the OSCE. So this will bring the question, okay, so how can I pass the VIVA or the OSCE? To pass the VIVA, you have, six you have three stations by six marks. So six examiners, each examiner will give you a mark. You need, you need to have no more than three fails in this exam in order to pass, or no more than one clear fail. If you have more than one clear fail in VIVA, not only you fail the VIVA, but you will fail the whole exam. This is very important. There is no compensation here. If you have more than one clear fail, you will fail the whole exam without compensation. Of course, you, you need to pass the OSCE. How to, how to pass the uh, OSCE exam? It will be by having uh, eight marks. So you will be um, evaluated by eight examiners. You shouldn't have more than three fails or one clear fail in this exam. So this will be the passing criteria for this exam. Some exam tips that I would like to share you based on my feedback from my candidates that first of all, you need to be very focused in clinical practice. So the problem that happens or the almost universal complaint in this exam that there is no enough time for clinical, no enough time to do your examinations. So 12 minutes for like three cases or sometimes four cases is very, very short time. And that's why, and they made this on purpose because if you are doing the examination techniques the first time in the exam, you will take some time and the examiner will recognize that. So in order to do the exam in the proper time, you need to be doing it by your subconscious and to do it by subconscious, you need to attend the many sub, uh, as much subspecialty clinics as possible. Like be, be minded by strabismus examination techniques, the use of indirect ophthalmoscopy, everything. And you are the only one who can tell what are the weak points that you are, that you have. So recognize your strength and, and weakness early, as early as possible, and try to attend subspecialty clinics to be aware of the common cases that occur or, or that appear on frequently basis in these subspecialty clinics and do the examination techniques. And second thing is practice the examination techniques. Don't just depend on watching videos or doing um, or reading the steps of the examination techniques. The more you do, the more it becomes by your subconscious. So in the exam, I'm telling you something. You have stress in the exam. You have, you have the option to have either one stress or two stresses. So one stress is doing the examination technique properly. And the, the second stress is to get findings. 
So it's on, it is, it is your choice to, to combine two stresses or one stress. I would prefer that it will be just single stress. So you do the examination techniques by heart and you just focus on the do, eliciting the signs or the examination data. So what makes the candidates fail in this exam that they focus on both, focusing on examination techniques, focusing on to get positive signs, and the third of the stress, even more that you need to speak as you examine. So you need to speak up the positive signs as you, as you examine. It is not like I'm staying silent until I finish my exam, and then I will tell the examiner what are the positive findings. It doesn't work like that. The examiner will always uh, pushing you to say the signs that you have, find, have found in the exam. In order to practice on that, you need to discuss cases with your colleagues as you examine. So it will, what I find from my experience and from other candidates' experience, if you have a study partner that you will just discuss the case with him, or if you have a colleague in clinics or have junior doctor in your clinic that you just discuss the exam uh, or discuss the case with him, it will not only help him, but will also help you. The other thing is a study. The exam is practical, so don't spend too much time on books. It's not like you need to study everything by heart. No, this will, will not be the correct way because the books will help you mainly in the VIVA station or the VIVA exam. And the VIVA exam will be more commonly um, the standard question. It will be not tricky questions or difficulty questions. It will be the questions which are expected from general ophthalmologists. So it will be like a general knowledge. But don't just focus, or this is another problem that mean some people or some candidates they just focus on studying as much as possible and forget about the clinical practice. And also the if you will just want a book, so FRs, SC3K Quok and Wong books are the most exam oriented. The course lectures will also be very helpful for you because they will just like juice. You can just the extract of the books and the candidates experience and examination techniques in the proper way. So they will save you a lot of time in, and, to, to, and will, be, will, will, will just format your brain in the FRCS way. So uh, watch them as soon as possible because as you know, they are lengthy and they will be helpful together with, with your study. And finally, in during the exam, try as much as possible not to speak the theoretical knowledge. So these are the tips from the successful candidates. Don't speak theoretical knowledge. I said this more than once, and I'm stressing on this again. Speak always practical, as if you, are, you have this patient in your clinic and you are managing him, okay? So another way to relieve your stress is to consider that the examiner is just your colleague, that you are discussing the case with them, not an examiner. And again, if you don't know, don't improvise. Please don't say that I don't recall or I don't know. Like one of my candidates who was successful in the, in the last exam, she had like cornea graft case and the examiner asked her some questions about cornea graft. And she told him that cornea grafts are not part of my routine practice. It is, I am not aware of that. And she passed the exam. So, it is another problem that candidates think that if they say, I don't know, they would fail. No, this wouldn't fail you, but what would fail you is that you say things or um, give answers that is not correct and you just show the confidence, the, the overconfidence that you know, but you actually don't know. Finally, I am just telling you the surprise that I am preparing for you uh, this for this session. And this was the surprise was the request of many of you, almost all of you. It will be that we will conduct the mock exam. Yeah. Finally, we I'm very pleased to announce to you that uh, I'm going to conduct a mock exam for the FRCS3. Uh, so the 
for and you might think why the mock exam and what is the value i think that all of you know why mock exam is important but just to tell you that the most important things is that you feel the pressure the problem that you have in the exam is that you this will be your first experience with a face-to-face -face exam of course in the life course we practice on this many many times and they always say that those who tend to uh, interact in live way those will perform better in the exam so if you just or if you do this with your with your resident or your consultant or your colleague you will still feel the pressure but if you don't interact in any way and just and wait till the exam you will have a tremendous amount of pressure so what is the purpose of this mock exam is to feel the pressure of the exam because uh, not in order not to feel the stress because this is the most complaint of the exam that it is stressful the second importance of the mock exam is to get a personalized feedback on your performance. So every one of us has different needs and different strengths and weaknesses. And sometimes you are not aware of that and you need some guidance. You need someone who tell you what is your strength points? What are your weak points that you need to work on in order to pass the exam? And also that you can ask questions like get personal assistance regarding confusing area in the exam. So you would sometimes when you, what I, I always received my, from my candidates, okay, I, do, I didn't pass the exam and I don't know why. Um, um, some, um, unfortunately, I wasn't with you in the exam to tell you, but if in the mock exam, if you, uh, if you didn't pass, I would, I would be able to tell you what is the problem. So you can ask why I didn't pass or what is the answer of this and that. And finally, be ready by working on your weak points before the exam. So if you just don't have this um, guidance or personalized feedback, you will be uh, you will be like studying everything and not focusing on your weak points and this will make you lose much time and of course that will uh, affect your performance in the exam so this mock exam this will be like live one to one session and this will be like huge pressure not only on you but also on me and that's why i was trying to like push back push back the mock exam as much as possible but eventually i would know that i need to do it even though that it is very time consuming it will be very pressurizing my time but i know i know that it will help you a lot and the duration it will be like two hours per each candidate so I, that's why it will be like too much pressure not only on you but also in me like I don't think that I would be able to do this by more than one candidate per day. So yeah, this is the way it is. It will be online live on Zoom and it will be on September and October, 2022. So this will be basically preparing the candidates who are applying for um, India exams in, in September and in the 1st of November. The terms of this exam or this uh, mock exam is that it will be based on the first to come first serve basis. So it will, um, it will have very limited capacity depending on my time. And there will be different levels of support that whatever, whatever you want just to do the exam or to do the exam with a personalized feedback. So this will be all available. And of course, our candidates will have a special privileges with reduced fees. Because, you know, when I tried to just to search about the mock exams, I would find that it's just quite expensive. Like in London, I course will just charge like around 700 pounds, which are around $900 for mock exam. I understand that. I understand how much difficulties that they will in encounter during preparing it. It is not an easy task. But as you know, we always do things which are of much better quality and much, much lower fees. So we will try to make it as affordable as possible. Uh, the thing also about the smoke exam that it will there will be no records because it is just a personalized thing for you. 
it is doesn't help anyone else. So the uh, it will need or the, the the feedback will be with you, but it is not like you will have the same cases in the exam. So it is just to know your performance, know to you to know your weak points. It is not that you will need to watch this again in order to memorize the questions and the answers. So there will be this will not be the value of this mock exam. So we will open or we will announce the, the or open the registration for this mock exam uh, very soon, probably the next week. I'm just uh, um, doing some arrangements regarding my time, my days off. Sometimes I will have to take days off from work. And, and then we will uh, launch the um, registration. Thank you very much. I hope this uh, session was, will be useful for you and just um, will be an eye opener for you to know how to uh, pass this exam. And I will be happy if you, anyone who is, I will start first by those who uh, had the exam in 2022. If they wanted to share us anything that I haven't said today, they will be, I will be very happy to, um, to, to hear them and to share their experience with you. So please raise your hand if you want to share in the uh, in the Q and A session. If not, if if no one wants to share any extra thing, then you all of you are free to ask whatever questions you want. Any question? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam, Dr. Muhammad. So Dr. Muhammad Hello. has been always one of the active and interactive candidates every time, every session, whatever it is, scientific or an orientation session. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad, you. for your you. um, engagement. Thank you, thank you, Jazakallah Khair, and uh, thanks a lot for your this orientation lecture. And uh, uh, really, I appreciate your uh, efforts, your struggle for uh, being with us uh, most of the time. And you are very much helpful for us whenever we need, and you are always there. Thanks a lot for your uh, concern regarding uh, 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 regarding us. Uh, my question, actually, that question, actually, you already mentioned everything. But I mean, uh, so you are the preferring that we should go be better to UK uh, if we will get, can get the opportunity uh, to go there, UK for the examination. Is it good good for everyone? I think so. No. I wouldn't say that you you will always pass if you go to the UK, or or you will not always pass if you go to an extra UK site, because it is very variable. But what I would say that in, at the moment, UK centers are better. And at the moment as well, UK centers are not open. So next year, UK centers will open and the non-UK centers will, will be more professional or will be more, uh, will be better in assessing the candidates. So it will be like the same situation. There will be like no real advantage or no real privilege to make you think of this and that. So what I would say that if you have the availability to go for the UK as a first option, okay, go for that. If not, don't wait for the UK because you don't know where will you pass, okay? Okay, thank you, thank you. And personal question that uh, you are going to be more younger and younger, what you are eating nowadays? What are you what? I couldn't hear that. You are... And Doctor, you are going to be more younger and younger, looking more handsome. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> when you, you finish your FRS three exams, you will getting more and more younger. You will get relieved out of stress. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Jazakallah. You're welcome. Okay, so you have many questions in the chat box. Let me just check that. 
uh, who are eligible to give FRCS three exams, those who had already passed the FRCS two or the ICO clinical, those who are eligible to apply for the FRCS three Glasgow exam. Question, all these information was about FRCS Glasgow or Edinburgh? No, they are about FRCS Glasgow because FRCS Edinburgh will still open the next year with no any information about it. So all informations regarding the FRCS Edinburgh exam, all parts are now withdrawn from the, the website because mostly they will change everything. So we are just waiting for their announcements. Does it matter if the speech is grammatically correct in the exam? No, doesn't matter at all. Just make your words understandable. Your voice is clear. This is the most important. You, need, you don't need to be fluent or your, um, your language will be perfect or with the English accent or with the British accent or uh, grammatically perfect. No, this is not an English test. Just to try to, your words to be clear and understandable, and it will be fine. Hi, Dr. Hamdi. Uh, will the candidates giving exam in November giving priority to enroll in the mock exams just to help the candidates? Yes, uh, of course. I will always. My candidates have the priority. So um, if you are you are all, uh, I didn't announce this session to. Um, our to different people or or for general because I give you the priority so it will be the priority to enroll in this mock exam will be for my candidates this will be the first thing also for those who will apply for the November and uh, September exams okay uh, how many times your part three exams is conducted this year it was conducted four times and uh, I would expect that next year will be even more like around six times. Is it possible if I apply for the exam and they accept me that to defer my exam if I'm not ready? Yeah, they would accept that because they have a long waiting list. We should bring any instruments with us to the exam. Okay, so this is a very important thing and I, I already answered it before in the orientation sessions. In the exam, they will have everything that you need. However, it is better to bring your own instruments for two reasons. First of all, if you have your own instruments, you will use it. Like if you have the occluder, you will use it to do cover and cover test. If you have your the pins, the, right, the, the red and white pins, you will use them for the confrontation test. If you have the target, you will use it for uh, the, also the cover and cover and the motility test. But if you don't have them, you will not use them. So it is just, it is not about the exam. It is about that you are not practicing. So if you use your, your own instruments and then bring them in the exam, it will much more relieve your stress to, you, to, to that, that you are using your own instruments, that you are doing the same things that you used to do before the exam. This is like a mental concept, like it is it just feel you more relieved. So this is one thing. The second thing is sometimes the exam conditions are not ideal. Let me give you an example. In my exam, I was asked, I was the last one in that day. So the patient had their pupil closed because he was dilated in the morning. And by the end of the day, his pupil become closed. And I was given a 78 diopter lens and has been asked to check the macula or check the patient. And it was a case of retinitis pigmentosa. So you need like more white field. And as we know, the 78 diopter lens will give more higher magnification. So I was struggling to use the 78 diopter lens to check the patient with a, like a small pupil. But I, I, found, I, I managed to uh, check uh, the, the spony spicules, so I did know the diagnosis. But what I'm saying is that when you have your instruments, you have your fundus lens, then you are, you are uh, more prepared for the exam. Not like if you, don't, if you have like use their fundus lens, you might find it like scratches or unclear for you, or you are unfamiliar with it. So try to be prepared with your own things. Uh, 
Dr. Yasmin, will you conduct a general case uh, discussions live? Unlikely, this is, will be very unlikely due to the, the time constraints and due to the length of the course. Uh, okay, so this is the case. In the Vive and OSCE bundle, there is a new simulation clinical course added. Could you elaborate? No, it is, was just that the, uh, the clinical and Vive and OSCE bundle is consisting of two courses, the clinical examination techniques, because some of our candidates asked us for that only, and the case simulation, which is basically the one-to-one -one discussions. So there is no new courses here. It is just that the Vive and OSCE bundle is now divided into two courses, depending on everyone's need. Dr. Kinana, uh, is it possible to have the mock exam later after the beginning of next year? Of course, it will be repeated next year, uh, depending on the dates of the exam. So when the Glasgow Royal College of Surgeons of Glasgow announced the new dates in 2023, we will announce also the new dates for the mock exam. Dr. Kumar, is there any preference for candidates who passed FRs as part to Glasgow in allotting the date over ICO candidates? No, I don't believe so. If past ICO clinical, can you directly give FRS S3 exam, or you need to have a minimum years of clinical experience before you are eligible to give FRS S3 exam? They will expect that you will have at least four and a half years of experience after internship, which are the required for FRS S2. And they don't ask for extra experience in FRS S3 because in the past, the, you, will, you, will or, you will already have this kind of experience for the FRCS2. But nowadays, after the ICO clinical collaboration or ICO clinical exemption from the FRCS2, you will still need to have the four and a half years of experience after the uh, internship in order to be eligible for the FRCS3. Which one is good to learn examination techniques extending our previous course or clinical examination techniques on iCourses website? Well, the, in order to learn the examination techniques, we already have, we already have like a, a small version of our course, which is a clinical examination course. And you can, if, you, if your only problem is just the clinical examination, uh, techniques is so that you can subscribe for the clinical examination techniques course only if you want the full package. So it will be uh, for the Vibe and OSCE. It depends on you. What are your needs? Uh, Sir, may I know if mock exams will be conducted only for candidates in September and November or anyone who shouldn't, who hasn't secured can apply? Since that, the candidates who secured a place in November and September are uh, they are the most urgent and my time will be very limited to offer a place for everyone so these will have a priority because the, the the main advantage of the mock exam is to prepare you for the exam so it is pointless that if you haven't secured a diet to apply for a mock exam it will help but there are priorities this is what i'm saying there are candidates who are have priority to and they need it more at that time so if I if candidates who are applying for the September and and uh, November exam, and they already I still have more, I can accommodate more candidates. I would open it for those who don't, who didn't have their exam uh, secured. What is the chance of waiting list people securing a place? Well, based on my previous candidates, it is it is not that much, but it happens. Four and a half years experience after passing the uh, postgraduate master of ophthalmology. No, which is after after passing the primary medical qualifications, then you have the post qualification one year of training. Sometimes they call it like a house officer or intern. So this will be like a year, or sometimes in other countries two years. And after that, the actual experience in ophthalmology, like residency, then you can count from day one. In OSCE station, would you be expected to do full examination? No, you will be asking to do examinations of certain things because time will not allow full examination. Like for example, in ptosis, do the uh, lid excursion or levator function. In ptosis, do the hurdle. So they will just know uh, or ask you, what will you do? 
So you may like outline the examination techniques and then they will tell you, okay, do me this or do me that, okay? For Europe centers are only in UK, Dr. Ihsan, I didn't understand your question. Uh, in Viva, can they show an image and ask the questions based on it? Yeah, a lot. And we said that in the course. They will show you like a picture of Avellino dystrophy and ask you what is that and uh, and describe it. This happens a lot. Exam centers in Europe are only in the UK, yes. So it is only in Glasgow and also in Malta. So Malta is in Europe, but it, it opened like before COVID and uh, we expect that it will reopen again. Well, we think less people will give him priority during uh, next opening, like for sure we will be given a place or should we apply as a new candidate? No, you will need to apply as a new candidate. Waiting list people don't have a priority because it is not that you uh, earned it. They are just to put you on the waiting list. Like it is not like you applied early, so you they put you on the waiting list. So it will be the same say the same thing when you when it is reopened again. There is no guarantees here. Any question? Dr. Ahmed, if I don't have access to specialty clinics, would it be helpful to practice on normal cases? And also, will it be no a problem to do something like hurdle for the first time in the exam? Uh, yes, of course, you can do examination techniques on normal, like I used to do it on my colleagues and they used to do, to do it on me. So this would also help. Uh, in the hurdle, if, you, if it is possible, Try to get a place with hurdle and do it because, yeah, when you do it for the first time in the exam, it will be discovered. They will know that you will do it for the first time. So try to get access to a hospital where they have hurdle or a clinic which have hurdle. It will help a lot. Dr. Shayma, is there investigations, the questions by showing OCT photo? Yes, of course. They will ask you general investigations of question, not like it is very detailed, like to know the pattern, where is hyperfluorescence, hypofluorescence, and what is the diagnosis in fluorescein, or if there is hyperreflectivity or hyperreflectivity, and what is the diagnosis in the OCT. Like, for example, in my exam, I have been shown an OCT for macular hole with the operculum flying in the vitreous. It's a grade four macular hole. And they were just pointing to the operculum and asking me, what is that? So I said it's the operculum, and this is a stage four macular hole. So it can ask basic details about the investigations. When answering a question, should you talk about everything that you know or wait for the examiner to ask you the questions? Uh, no, you will, if you are asking, has been asking a question, try first to describe, then to give a differential diagnosis, and then the examiner will take it from there, okay? So, uh, because if you just say everything that you know, then your speech or your uh, answer will sound more theoretical. We don't want it to be more theoretical. We want it to be more practical. So try to be descriptive as much as possible. Try to give a differential diagnosis as much as possible, but it is within the case, but don't say things that are not applicable. Like for example, if a disease is common in young and or a disease that happens only in young and then you say that uh, this and the examiner tell you that this is a, like a young boy and then you tell him like this can be also in the uh, the same thing that can happen in, in old age then you are speaking theoretical because he is speaking about this patient who has this picture so don't say about a young, an older age, because if, it, the, the, because if you speak about an older age, then you are just memorizing the book. Be, or be uh, focused on what is asked in the exam. Six times a year, meaning two times a year in Delhi, per se, Mumbai per se, Bangalore per se, can be expected later. Uh, unlikely that it will be two times per the same location per year. For India, it is an exception. You can expect that it will happen two times 
per year in India. But for other locations, I think it will be difficult. Like for Egypt, it could be one time or two times. Actually, I, I don't have a conclusive answer in that. It will all depends on how the Royal College will arrange that. How do you suggest learning your efforts as a course? I mean, how to get about learning each case? Well, I would suggest that you watch the video and then you will uh, read the, uh, the relevant chapter on the cases from the uh, Showa, oh, sorry, from the, uh, from Wong book and the FRS S3 book. And if there is examination techniques uh, try to practice them on a patient better or normal individual and then you are progressing in the course. So this is the, the best thing. Just listen to it, read it, and practice it. Uh, I joined late, is this session recorded? Uh, I believe so. I believe it is recorded. And I think that it is recorded, yes. Uh, sir, any idea of when the diet will open approximately? I believe they will open by the end of the year. So mostly you will, get, you will expect that in the first three months in 2023, there will be a diet. So in the first three months. How many months before our date of first exam should course be joined? It depends on you. Like if you, how many hours per day that you can study? Can you study like two hours per day, three hours, six hours? Among you have some candidates. One, uh, there is a candidate among you, Dr. Mahmoud Ashur, who told me that he finished all my videos, all the course in less than two weeks. Others, it may take them like four, uh, four months. So it depends on how are dedicated you are, how, how free you are, how is your schedule is tight or not. So it depends on how you live, like two, three, four, six hours, you are working part-time, full-time, or you are totally free. So no single answer for everyone. Any other question? Okay, so I think this will be the end of our session. If you have any other question, please share in the groups so that we can, uh, we can discuss this uh, later on. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I hope that this session is beneficial for you, especially for those who joined us late. Uh, hopefully that you have now more clear concept about how would you proceed in your preparation. Wish you all the best in your exam and good luck. Thank you very much.